Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The presence of God is here. Let's worship him this evening. The great I am, the Lamb of God. The I am that I am. The creator that was not created. Let's worship him this evening. Hallelujah. With the revelation of who he is, let's worship him this evening. Hallelujah. Here we are, lifting our hands to you. Here we are, giving you thanks for all you do. As we pray. And worship your holy name. You are here. You are here. Dwelling, dwelling within our faith. Here we are. Here we are. Welcome to church. Hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty Reign. Hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty Reign. This is the day he has made. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise in the Lord. Praise in the Lord. 
the Lord of my soul. This is the day he has made. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord of my soul. This is the day he has made. Thank you, Lord. We bless your name. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Please, you may be seated. Thank you, music team. Thank you, everyone. Please, you may be seated in the presence of the living God. Tonight, I'd just like to get straight into the word. I'd like to teach. I'm starting a series from today. I'm not sure yet if I'll be taking it on Sundays as well. Likely, but not sure yet. So, um, I call this the revelation of Jesus. The revelation of Jesus. Please let us pray. Father, we thank you once again. Your presence is here amongst us. We acknowledge you as Lord, as King, as Savior. We commit every heart into your hands, as many as are connected physically present, as many as are connected remotely present, and through the live streaming platforms, as many as we hear this hereafter in the recording on the recording devices, we ask for a true revelation, an accurate revelation of your son Jesus, that it may be that. These things may be well implanted in our hearts and provoke the appropriate response, the appropriate transformation, and the appropriate impact through our lives. We thank you, Father, because we are prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. So today I'd like to begin to share with us on the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus is crucial and central to a victorious and enduring Christian life. The revelation of Jesus is crucial and central to a victorious and enduring 
outlasting storms, outlasting trials, outlasting delays. The revelation of Jesus will equip us to outlast the trials of life. The revelation of Jesus brings us into salvation. Without church, does not save any human being. Men of God cannot save anyone. The role of the church, principal in the roles of the church, is to bring forth the revelation of Jesus. And the role of men of God, when you study Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 11 to verse 13, principal function, a principal function of the pastors, the evangelists, the teachers, the prophets, the apostles, is amongst other things to bring forth the revelation of Jesus. The Bible uses the language till we all come in the knowledge, or I like to say the revelation knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the fullness of the stature of the Son of God. So it is the revelation of Jesus that brings us into salvation. It is the revelation of Jesus that enables growth. If you lack the revelation of Jesus, you may be hanging around church, you may be involved in church, you may be involved in church activities, but you will not grow. You study also in 1 John chapter 1 from verse um, 23, and you study on to chapter 2 and verse 3, you will see the language used there that we show the word of God, which is by the gospel is preached to us, is what is able to make us to endure. This word of God endures forever. And now he says we should do away with all malice and all envy and jealousy and all of those things you find in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 1. He said as newborn babies born into the kingdom because of the revelation of Jesus Christ. He said these are the sincere milk of the word that you may grow. So if you're going to grow, it's also dependent on the revelation of Jesus. The milk of the word is... I mean, is a vehicle and a channel for transmitting to infants or infant level revelation of Jesus. And so he says, these are the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. It takes the revelation of Jesus to give us capacity to represent Jesus. Represent Jesus in your marriage. Represent Jesus to your spouse. Represent Jesus on the highway when there are uh, contentious people on the highway, driving anyhow, behaving anyhow in public spaces. The revelation of Jesus has a way of tempering our lives, regulating our mindset, and so that we have that supernatural capacity to represent Jesus in any space, represent him in your business. Represent him in your family. Represent him in your thoughts. The revelation of Jesus gives capacity to represent him. The revelation of Jesus equips us to walk in divine authority. You're able to handle challenges. Able to handle demonic opposition handle diabolic devices it is the revelation of jesus it's you cannot afford copy and paste handling demonic devices diabolic devices can be a dangerous grounds when you engage in copy and paste the bible tells us of the sons of skiva when you read in acts of the apostles we are told how i think that's acts of the apostles chapter 19 they had been hearing about jesus they have been hearing about paul they saw the exploits paul was having as a representative, someone who had comprehended the, the revelation of Jesus, been to the deserts of Arabia, trained specially by Jesus for about three years. It's, they saw the exploits of Paul and they felt they could also copy and paste. So they saw a demonic situation and someone possessed of a demon. And so they started to say, we, we adjure you in the name of um, Jesus, whom Paul preaches. So the demon said, <laughs> Paul, I, I know I fear. Jesus, I know I fear. Who are you? He started to say, don't you know I have a BSc? I have a master's in engineering. I have a master's in business administration. 
have a doctorate in divinity, I have a doctorate in religious studies. Don't you, don't you recognize that? <laughs> he, they lack the revelation of Jesus. And that demon-possessed guy pounced on them, stripped them bare, they ran out naked. And the noise of what happened spread all over the place. Lacking the revelation of Jesus will be a dangerous terrain to handle diabolic situations, demonically inspired challenges. But when you carry the revelation of Jesus, you can walk in his authority. Because those who hear you, hear him. Those who see you, see him. What LFB OC that you tremble. He said, Tremble thou at, at the presence of the Lord. So those who hear you, hear him. He said, Whosoever um, uh, receives you, receives me. And whosoever receives me, receives the ones who are, uh, the one who has sent me. So there is a chain of command. But you are better be walking in revelation. Copy and paste is a dangerous ground to demonstrate the authority of the kingdom. The revelation of Jesus will enable us. To endure all things. The revelation of Jesus will enable us to endure all things and develop in his character. Where are the protocol people in this house? Apart from Brother Dotson. Is there any other protocol person here? Okay, no, no, no. Don't, don't worry. We sit down. We are. So, but when we are up here, we know what we are handling. That distraction is much. The child can be taken to the back. Please. All right, so tonight I'd like us to embark on a journey of discovery. Discovery of the revelation of Jesus is central to your life, central to your faith. You are going to be able to handle any aspect of life as a child of God, spirit filled, born again. You cannot negotiate away the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'd like you to turn your Bibles with me tonight to Revelation chapter 1. I'd like to read from verse 1 to verse 2. Revelation chapter 1, from verse 1 to verse 2. And it reads, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. That is, you see the chain of command there again. Jesus did not do anything on a frolic of his own. He recognized, he yielded to, he submitted to. The chain of command. There was nothing Jesus did, not in his earthly ministry, not before his earthly ministry, not after his earthly ministry, that he did without recognizing the Father and submitting to the authority of the Father. And look at the sequence here again. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, that's the Father, gave unto him, that is Jesus Christ the Son. So what we comprehend of Jesus is because there is a chain of command initiated by the Father. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God the Father gave to him the Son to show to his servants, the servants of God, in every place, in every age. This which was written over 2,000 years ago still has strong prophetic relevance and application to us today. So he says this revelation, the Father permitted the son to show and show to who to his servants things that must shortly come to pass and he that is the son jesus sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant john look at the chain of command there from the father to the son from the son to an angel from an angel from an, at the angel the angel of jesus christ and sent to this apostle banished for the faith and being a witness of Jesus to the island of Patmos. He says, and this servant John, the beloved apostle, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ 
and of all things that he saw. I'd like to read further. So you see there, that chain of command, that's why I read that place. So Revelation has a train. Scholarship will not push you into the revelation of Christ. In church, with, that is known that the authority of Jesus cannot confer to you the revelation of Christ. It's from the Father and to the Son and through the Son and through his angels, like in this context, to his servants. And particularly his servant here, John. Verse 9. I read on to verse 11. He says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. Today's church, you don't like to hear such things. Tribulation, trouble, sufferings, affliction, delays. But when you study the New Testament with a neutral mind, with an objective mind, there is no how a Christian can negotiate challenges away. Impossible. But that's not my focus tonight. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle or island that is called Patmos. Why? Because of the word of God. Because he stood for Jesus. He preached Jesus. He proclaimed Jesus. He walked in the power of Jesus. He ministered in the grace of Jesus. They tried to kill him. When you read um, um, Fox's book of the Matthias. You see how each of those apostles. And many other Matthias. The things they went for. And they went through. For the name of Jesus. So they tortured him. They tried to kill him. They did not succeed. So they banished him to this island of Patmos. Where they put condemned criminals. I'm not done. He said it was an island called Patmos for the word of God. And for the testimony. He bought testimony. He was a witness. Of what he contacted. Not by scholarship. But by revelation. And for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega. I wish I could dwell here. And Jesus introducing himself here, so many aspects of the revelation of Jesus. I'll take you through some of them tonight. One principal one, but I'll mention some other ones. Saying, I am, Jesus is revealing himself here as the Alpha and Omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. The New Testament was written in the Greek. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Just like you have A in English and a Z or Z in English. The first and the last. It was simply saying, I am the first, I am the last. I am the beginning, I am the end. Saying, I am Alpha, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. My interest here, as we build up here tonight, for reading this passage. You will see that the revelation given to John, the beloved apostle, so that he can write and make available to the church. The message given to each of these seven churches was meant to be collected and compiled together so that all the churches read what is sent to each church. So that one church learns the message sent to each primarily, but also learns and takes a cue from the message sent to the other six churches. I shared with us many years ago, this was about 30 years ago, God gave me a revelation. It was like a big balloon. And there were people all around it, around it, around the diameter of the, the balloon. But the balloon, I mean, not balloon, a ball. A ball, probably the diameter of this hall from the floor to the ceiling in diameter so nobody could see all of the ball you can only see where you are at 
You can't see even around the curve of the ball. So they needed to ask it on each other in that revelation. What's the ball like? What's the color of the ball? So different people at different segments round it, round it, while saying different things based on what they saw. And the Lord said to me, 1994, that you will not be able to come into the fullness of the revelation of Christ unless you learn what is revealed to you and you are humble enough to learn what is revealed to the others. And that is also very cap um, captured very well here. So he said, listen, I read that verse 11 again, saying, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches. When you begin to read the report from Revelation chapter 2 to Revelation ch chapter 3, you will see that he directed specific things to each of the seven churches. Yet he's telling the seven churches to learn from one another. There are so many things to say there, but let me narrow it down to a few things here. So you will see to those seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, uh, um, Pagamos, Theatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, you will see a structure of the report. Jesus revealed himself. Jesus talked about their strengths for the ones that had strengths or good works. Jesus revealed their weaknesses. Jesus revealed what they had to overcome. Jesus revealed the reward for the overcomers. Five parts of the structured revelation. Revealed himself. Revealed their strengths or good works. Revealed their shortcomings or weaknesses. Revealed what they had to overcome. Revealed the, the reward that will come to them if they overcome. But you know, the most important part of each of those revelations was the revelation of Jesus himself. What are strengths and weaknesses if it is not anchored on the revelation of Jesus? How do you overcome without the revelation of Jesus? Who gives you the rewards without the revelation of Jesus? So the most important thing is not even the strengths or the weaknesses or what to overcome. So you see to each of those seven churches, it started by saying... I am this, I am that, I am this, I am that. And I'd like to quickly run through that. I captured about 17. Apart from this intro in chapter 1, because here you see, he said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. In another place, he said, I'm the first and the last. In another place, he said, I'm the one who was dead and I'm alive forevermore. That is for another day in chapter 1. But focusing on the revelation to the churches, he revealed himself in different ways to the different churches. You will not see any aspect of the revelation of Jesus duplicated to any of those churches. Are you still in here? And so I'd like us to understand here the principal thing and the primary thing in his message to the church, in his message. To this church, in his message, to any church where Jesus is Lord, is the revelation of Jesus himself. Not just that, oh, you are strong, you have breakthrough, oh, you are weak, you have um, been overcome by um, sexual immorality and all of those things. The principal, the primary revelation he brought to each of those churches was a revelation of himself. Friends, it takes the revelation of Jesus to know who you really are. We don't know ourselves as we really ought to know. Paul thought he was the best thing he could do for God. He thought he was a religious zealot. When he, when he encountered Jesus, when Jesus found him, he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. He thought he was doing God a service. He didn't know he was opposing the things of God until he came to a revelation of Christ. And I want to challenge every one of us. Also. You don't really know who you are. You don't really know your potentials. You don't even potentials for good or for evil. You don't really know what you can become. But the revelation of Jesus will help to streamline. The revelation of Jesus will help to galvanize great things. The revelation of Jesus will help to put your life on the pathway that God designed you for. 
It is the revelation of Jesus. I mean, it takes the revelation of Jesus to know who you really are. And I just gave us the example of Paul, Acts chapter 9 from verse 3 to verse 5. It takes the revelation of Jesus to know where you belong in him. You can imagine taking those churches at random. By the time you hear the way he revealed himself, you begin to find out that he's talking to the Pagamos saints. By the time you begin to hear the way he revealed himself in some other dimensions, I have the key of David. I, can, I am the one who opens a door and no one can shut. I'm the one who shuts a door and no one. When you begin to say those things, you know those who are walking in that revelation, they belong to a particular church. You will not know where you belong in him and your role in him until you come to a revelation of Jesus. And furthermore here, let me also put some additions to that. You will not know where you belong in Jesus until he begins to reveal himself to you. And you begin to realize that maybe like Paul, you thought you were saved, then you realize you are not born again. No, you have no place in him. Until he begins to reveal himself, then you begin to realize you thought you were already a leader. You thought you already know so much. Then the revelation of Jesus makes you to begin to realize with the carnality in you, with your test boards for carnal things, for worldly things, you are still a baby, though you have been 10 years in the faith. First Corinthians chapter 3 addresses that from verse 1 to verse 3. He said, I cannot speak to you as unto spiritual. I cannot speak to you as unto mature. And seeing that your test boards, you are still looking for milk. You cannot handle meat. He said, you are carnal. You are babies. So it's the revelation of Jesus, not your age in the church, not your position in the church, not your title in the church, not your tight records in the church, not your affinity to your geo or your pastor that determines your placement in him. It is the revelation of Jesus that will make you to know where you belong. I know God doesn't even have a problem with babies, but he has a problem with babies who are not developing. Because you see in 1 Peter chapter 2, it talks about babies as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow. So in that context, he had no problem with babies, simply challenging them to grow. But by the time you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 from verse 1 to verse 3, you begin to see that God has a problem with babies. When I want to feed you with milk, I mean feed you with meat. But when I see your response, when I see your longings, when I see the kind of things you desire... I saw that I can't relate to you as unto spiritual. But I have to relate to you as unto babies. As unto carnal. Where there, is, uh, where there is strife amongst you. Where there is bitterness. Where there is sectarianism. Are ye not carnal? Are ye not babies? And then you take it further. In another dimension in Hebrews chapter 5. When you read from verse 12 to verse 14. He said when you need to be leaders. You need to be teachers. You need to be grooming other people to become disciples. You are still being taught. The first principles of the oracles of God. And you, you, are, you need to be fed with milk. Seeing that you cannot handle strong meat. He said milk is for babies. Strong meat is for the mature. So it is the revelation of Jesus that will make you realize where you are at in him. You can have the head of a whole church. When you look at the parameters of his life. When you look at the test boards of his life. You see that even though he's pastoring 1,000 people. He's still a baby in the kingdom. And a baby cannot raise mature people. A baby cannot raise disciples. A baby that is feeding on, on milk cannot raise people who should be feeding on strong meat. Open to Hebrews chapter 5. I need to read that. From verse 12 to verse 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, for when the time for when I mean for when for the time you ought to be teachers, imparting knowledge, raising others on a higher level in the kingdom, you have need that one still be teaching you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such a hard need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that use, useth milk is unskillful, unlearned, immature in the word of righteousness. For he's a baby. 
Verse 14, but strong meat. Somebody say strong meat. If you will grow, one proof of your growth is that your test. Can you imagine a newborn baby fed with milk? And you know they tell us in medical health science that the best nutrient for a child first one year is milk from the mother's breast. And now you see a 17 year old boy, 18 year old man, still trying to grab after the mother to feed on milk. See the way we, we exclaim here tonight. Hear the exclamation amongst us here tonight. But now relate that to spiritual things. But strong me belongs to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use, by reason of practice, have their senses, spiritual senses, not natural senses, exercise. Exercise that means trained. You are taught some things, you practice it. You are taught some things, you practice it. You are taught some things, you take it out there, you practice it. You are taught some things, you bring it in here, you practice it. When you do that, you are growing. Your spiritual senses will be exercised to discern both good and evil. Friends, it is the revelation. It takes the revelation of Jesus Christ to know what he thinks of you. To know your strengths, to know your weaknesses, to know what to overcome. Just like with those seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. It takes the revelation of Jesus to know the things you need to overcome. It takes the revelation of Jesus to know the rewards awaiting you as a Christian and as an overcomer. I like to just highlight, I want to teach it. I want to highlight the several to each of those seven churches, some he revealed like five aspects of him on himself. To some he revealed like two aspects of himself. To some he revealed like three aspects of himself. To some he revealed like one aspect. I think only to the church at Pagamos, he revealed only one aspect of himself. But I put everything together. And hear this. Look at the revelation of himself to the churches of his saints. In Revelations chapter 2 and 3. And amongst other things, Jesus revealed himself as one. He who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Today is not the day for teaching that. I mean teaching these things. I just mentioned here. One, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Two, Jesus revealed himself to his saints, the church. He who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Number three, Jesus revealed himself again, just like he revealed himself to John in chapter one. Now he's revealing himself to the church as the first and the last. Number four, he revealed himself as he who was dead and came to life. Number five, he revealed himself as he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Like I said, I don't want to dig into these things tonight. I just want to mention here. There's a particular one I want to focus on. Number six, he revealed himself as the son of God. Number seven, he revealed himself as he who has eyes like a flame of fire. Just begin to imagine the import and the meaning of these revelations of Jesus Christ. As the one with eyes like flame of fire. <laughs> That was why the people who are leaning on his chest, like John, the beloved apostle, who wrote this book, leaning on his chest in the gospel, when he saw this dimension, he, he fell flat. He couldn't look on his face. He said, ah, Jesus, I gave him a wiper when I saw him in my dream. <laughs> I, I doubt whether that's the real Jesus, <laughs> the glorified one. I did high, high five to him. Uh, the people, I've read the bits of people who have come to the revelation of Jesus. They tremble at that sight. He said here, in number six, no, number seven, he revealed himself as he who has eyes like a flame of fire. Number eight, he who has feet like fine brass. Number nine, he who has the seven spirits of God. Number 10, he who has the seven stars. He's not just holding them in his hands. He has them. Message for another day. Number 11, he who is holy. 
I appeal to you to get this message and listen again and again and again. Because I'm on a zip code, I'm compressing many things. Number 12, he revealed himself as he who is true. Number 13, he revealed himself as he was the key of David. Number 14, he revealed himself as he, he who opens and no one shuts, and he shuts and no one opens. Opens the way, opens the door, opens the heavens, and no one shuts and shuts, and no one has the capacity or the authority to open it. Number 15, he revealed himself as the Amen, the finality of God, the so be it of heaven. Let me leave that. He revealed himself as the faithful and true witness. He revealed himself as the beginning. When God started to create, he started with his son. As the beginning of the creation of God. So in my own study, maybe you will see more from the revelation to those churches. I saw about 17. Apart from the ones he revealed to John before he started to reveal about the state of the church history. So tonight, I want to focus on a particular aspect of the revelation. I see, each revelation, just like the revelation I had 1994, be, it, it, everyone was right. I saw crimson. I saw lilac. I saw purple. I saw burgundy. I saw sky blue. I saw, saw royal blue. I saw midnight blue. Everyone was right. But we needed to learn from one another. Tonight I'd like to focus on the revelation of Jesus Christ as the son of God. Or as the son of the living God. When you study scriptures, you will notice different people or let me use the language term personalities. Different personalities endorsed, affirmed, confirmed the revelation of Jesus as the Son of God. And I'd like to start with the angel that brought the revelation of the conception Mary, the virgin, was about to experience. Luke chapter 1, I'd like to read from verse 30 to verse 35. I'm talking of diverse people who testified to his sonship. Number one here, he was prophesied as the son of God by an angel. A ranking angel, an archangel by the name of Gabriel. Luke chapter 1 from verse 30 to verse 35. And the angel said unto her, fear not Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. And shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great. And he shall be called the son of the highest. Give back to a son because of the gender of what you are producing. Then he escalated it. He shall be called the son of the highest. Who is the highest? We will soon find out. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this thing be? I'm a virgin. I've never been touched. Sin, I know not a man. And conclusively in verse 5, and the, angel answered on, the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest, because what you are producing will be called the son of the highest. So the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called, what? Called who? The son. the son of God. You give back to a son in terms of the gender of what you are going to produce. He shall be called the son of the highest. Because the power of the highest will come upon you. And when you give back to him, he shall be called the son of God. So, a high-ranking angel, one of the three scripturally recognized archangels, Gabriel by name, brought this 
revelation of Jesus as son. Quickly. And then you see after he was born. And he was to be introduced to commence his messianic ministry. And then you see John the Baptist. The prophet. The forerunner of Jesus Christ. Also bringing revelation of Jesus as the son of the living God. I'd like to read scriptures to corroborate that as well. John chapter 1 from verse 29 to verse 34. The next day John said Jesus coming unto him. And he said behold the Lamb of God. Which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said. After me cometh a man. Which is preferred before me. For he was before me. In existence before me. Ordained before me. Commissioned before me. And I knew him not. But that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I might come. Baptizing with water. And baptizing with water. And John bear record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove. And it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said to me, John, whom thou shalt see, I mean upon, excuse me, upon whom thou shalt see the spirit descending and remaining on him. The same is he which baptizes with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Ghost. And he says, and I saw, <laughs> and have, and bear record, that this is the Son of God. May you encounter Jesus. Amen. May the revelation of Jesus be implanted in your heart. When that revelation comes into your heart, there will be no force of this life. There will be no victory in this life. There will be no success of this life that will unseat, that will push away, that will relegate, that will make void or impotent the power of that revelation in your life. Paul came to a stage in his life, having been an apostle for several years, probably decades, he's yet he was praying, Philippians chapter 3 verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings. If that I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Having served the Lord for about 30 years at this point in time. He was still pushing and pressing for a revelation of Jesus. And furthermore here, not just the angel Gabriel. Not just John the Baptist. Quickly, the Holy Spirit also revealed Jesus as son of the living God. And read in Romans chapter 1 from verse 1 to verse 4 quickly I read. Paul is servant of Jesus Christ. Called to be an apostle. Separated unto the gospel of God. Verse 2 in bracket. Meaning you can remove the whole of verse 2. And it will still make sense to read from verse 1 to verse 3 and verse 4. He said which, had, which he had promised before by his prophets in the holy scriptures. Concerning his son. Concerning his son. Let's read verse 1, then jump to verse 3. Let's take out what is in the bracket. And, uh, that's verse 2. Paul is servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Verse 3. Concerning his son, that is the son of God. The gospel, I bring to you the gospel of God. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So he had a natural birth. So he was born in a manger in, in Bethlehem on a certain date. And people visited him. Shepherds visited him. The Magi or the, the, the wise men visited him. So the son of David according to the flesh. Look at verse 4. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. Spirit of holiness also means Holy Spirit. It's just that the emphasis here is on the holiness of the spirit of God. And so he said, declare to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. So the Holy Spirit affirmed, endorsed, validated what angel, the angel had said before he was conceived. The, uh, what John the Baptist revealed when he was to commission, uh, start his public ministry. The Holy Spirit also validated his sonship, his divine sonship here. And not just the Holy Spirit, quickly, number four. God the Father also validated the Son, commissioned the Son, endorsed the Son. Matthew chapter 3. 
from verse 16 to verse 17 and Jesus when he was baptized went up straight away out of the water and in the and lo the heavens were opened unto him and he saw the spirit of God the spirit of holiness the Holy Spirit descending like a dove and lighting and remaining upon him and lo a voice from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is validation from the Father. John chapter, I mean Matthew chapter 17. Now on the Mount of Transfiguration, Luke chapter 9 gives the report. He went with three of his apostles to pray, but four people went to pray. Only one prayed. But Matthew chapter 17, I'd like to read from verse um, 5 to verse 6. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were so afraid. Furthermore, you see that even when Satan came to tempt, to test Jesus, it was on the veracity of his sonship. It was on the issue of it. He didn't come to test him for power. He come to test him for all that than he said, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, when you read the reports in Matthew chapter 4, the, the temptation in the wilderness, out of the three temptations, two were towards, if you are the son of God, turn stone to bread. If you are the son of God, jump down from this pinnacle of the temple. So even Satan went out to tempt him on the basis of his sonship not on the basis of being the seed of david not on the basis of being a miracle worker not on the basis of te profound teachings but to take the grounds out of the basis of every other thing he demonstrated which is the sonship i need to move a little bit faster here so that's number five tested by satan because of his sonship Furthermore, number six, even demons recognized and testified that Jesus is the Son of God. You can read in Matthew chapter 8, from verse 28 to verse 29, I will read that. You can also get home and read Mark chapter 3, verse 11, Luke chapter 4, verse 41. But I want to read that report in Matthew. Matthew chapter 8, from verse 28 to verse 29. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gagasins, there met him two possessed with devils or demons coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out when they saw him. They cried out saying, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? The question there was not about his sonship. The question is, what have you come to do to us? Have you come to I mean, to judge us before the time? Have thou come hither to torment us before the time? So even demons knew Jesus. So sometimes when they want to expose him, you keep quiet there and get out of him. Bible says in James chapter 2 that even demons believe that Jesus is the son of God and they tremble. But it is not a belief of faith. It is a belief of knowledge. <laughs> Alright. Quickly, number 6. When heaven gave revelation to Peter, even Peter testified that this is the son of the living God. You know, Jesus was asking, well, who do people say that I am? They said all sorts. Some say you are Isaiah. Some say you are Jeremiah. Some say the kind of message you bring is hard like Jeremiah's message. You must be Jeremiah the prophet who has come back again. Some say you are Elijah with the kind of power you are demonstrating. Then he turned to them. You have been working with me for a while. Who do you say that I am? Look at Peter's response. Matthew chapter 16 from verse 15 to verse 17. He said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. Message for another day. The Christ dimension of his revelation. Then he said, The Son of the living God. 
And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bajona. He intentionally called him Simon Bajona there, showing his humanity. You know, it was Jesus who named him Simon Peter. But he was trying to say, Look, this dimension of you, you are human, but something heavenly came upon you. That is why you cannot use scholarship to come to the revelation of Christ. You cannot use seminary to come to the revelation of Christ. You cannot use your experience, your circumstantial experience to describe the revelation of Christ. It must first be inborn. He said, when it pleased God to reveal his son in me. Don't use your circumstances to say, eh, it's like I'm born again now. What if the circumstances change? When they promised you a check, the check was given, the check was presented in the bank, the check did not ba- bounce like basketball. Ha! Ah, oh, Jesus. Ah! <laughs> he has done it again. Oh, he has done it again. What if the next check is basketball? We need to be Jesus. And will you sing in the banking hall that he has done it again? No, oh, he has done it again. A revelation of Christ is not scholarship. That was why Jesus had to tell him this Simon Bajona, this dimension is not what your humanity accessed. Flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. Quickly, my time is running. Number eight, the revelation of Jesus was confirmed by the people who beat him up. So that's beat him black and blue. You need to read Isaiah. You know, in recent times, God has been taking me through some studies on the sufferings of Christ. You need to read Isaiah chapter 52 from about verse 13 and read it into chapter 53, verse 6. You don't want your enemy to go through what he went through. If you comprehend the revelation of the sufferings of Christ. But look at this here. The same people who beat him black and blue. Beat him with 39 strokes. Beat him with with whips that had all manner of metallic shrapnels. And and dry bones of animals on the edges. So one stroke like this can leave eight marks. Because it rolls around his body. Then they draw it. And it lacerates his body all over. He said, when we behold him, there will be no comeliness about him. That we may desire him. But look at the report of even the Roman soldiers. Matthew chapter 27 from verse 50 to verse 54. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. That is, torn into two. From top to bottom. Not a human orchestration from the earth. From heaven to the earth. And the earth did quake. And the rocks rent or was split open. And the graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Verse 54. Now when the centurion and the other soldiers, centurion is the head of a troop of army that are 100 in number. So a centurion is head, like leader of a hundred soldiers. When the centurion and they, those people, they were not, they were soldiers. And they that were with him, who were involved in beating Jesus in Pilate's hall. He said, watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying truly, unbelievers testified. This was the son of God. Let me see in the remaining time I have Let me share with us a few lessons that the revelation of his sonship should build into your heart. The revelation of Jesus as the son of God should 
build into the heart of every Christian who is becoming a Jesus disciple. One thing, one reason, one lesson we learn from the revelation of Jesus as the Son of God is so that we comprehend that Jesus is the pattern son. The plumb line. The standard bearer of the father. That everything God is looking for in how to behave, in how to function, in how to obey, in how to endure, in how to live life. Jesus became like the template for it. Jesus became like the mold for it. Jesus became like the standard for it. I use the language plumb line. You know, artisans, builders, they have what they call the plumb line. They use, to, they use it to check the vertic vertical nature of the walls and the pillars they are constructing. That this is in line. It is perpendicular. 90 degrees. Very upright. Very much in order. Now, Jesus is the plumb line of the believer. You want to know how to please the Father? Look to Jesus. You want to know how to talk to the Father? Look to Jesus. You want to know how to please the Father? Look to Jesus. You want to know how to obey the Father? Look to Jesus. He is the pattern son. Everything God can require and desire of humanity is played out in the life of Jesus as the son of God. I'd like to read Amos. Look, I want to emphasize that plumb line and Jesus being our plumb line even in the Old Testament I'd like to read here Amos chapter 7 from verse 7 to verse 8 he said this is what he showed me the Lord stood by a straight wall with a plumb line in his hand the Lord said to me Amos what do you see I said a plumb line then the Lord said see I will put a plumb line among my people. Take note of that. I will put a plumb line among my people. Okay, I'm reading the New Century Version. Let me read this and then I'll come back to this New Century Version. So he said, and the Lord said to me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then he said, Lord, behold. I mean, then said the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. Let me read the New Century Version again. This is what he showed me. The Lord stood by a straight wall and a plumb line in his hand. The Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I will put a plumb line among my people Israel to show how crooked they are. I will not look the other way any longer. I want my standards. I want my ally I want alignment. I am a straight wall. I'm standing by a straight wall. But every time they come close to the wall, I see their crookedness. I've been looking away hitherto. But now I've sent the sun. Let me like let me add that. Jesus is the plumb line by which he wants to regulate, by which he wants to align. So as we consider this revelation of Jesus tonight, every one of us, we need to look into our lives, our thoughts, our conduct, our service in the house of God, our function in the public place, the way we function as a husband, the things we do as a wife, the things we do in business. Jesus is the plumb line of the believer. And God is saying, I will not look away anymore. But he's not quick to judge. He's simply saying, allow the plumb line to set you up and straighten out your crookedness. Are you still in here? Let me read that verse 8 again. Then the Lord said, see, I will put a plumb line among my people. And that plumb line is the revelation of Jesus. I don't want my people to be crooked anymore. I will not overlook their crookedness anymore. I will not look away from their crookedness anymore. I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people. Israel. To show how crooked they are. I will not look the other way any longer. If you want to know what God the Father requires of you. Requires of human beings. Look to Jesus. As the son of God. 
Quickly on a second level, the revelation of Jesus as the Son of God, a second lesson it brings to us is that he makes us to realize that God is also a father over a family. Many a times we know God in the dimension of him as creator. Creator of the heavens and the earth and which is right and which is true. We know God as the righteous judge. The one who is able to kill. The one who is able to make a life. And which is true. We know God as the almighty. When you look at the Old Testament, you begin to see God as El Elyon. You begin to see God as the Elohim. You begin to see God as the El Shaddai. You begin to see God as the Adonai, the Lord and Master. You begin to see God as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. You begin to see God as Jehovah Nisi, the banner of victory over our lives and families. So many expressions of God in the Old Testament, but Jesus changed the order. They saw him as God, the almighty God, the self-existing God, the preeminent God, the Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. But when Jesus came, he changed the dynamics. That this God who is self-existent, who is almighty, who is the banner of victory, who is the one who heals us, he can be related to. You can fellowship with him. He has a family that he's raising. And Jesus is the pioneer in that family. Are you still in here? Before Jesus came, humanity did not know God. Neither could they relate to God as father. Jesus changed that. I've given on some names here. Uh, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is near. El Elyon, the God who is able to do. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. But when Jesus came, he brought a new dimension, a new way of living. Not, in, not just in all of the cross in two dimensions. I've emphasized that in this house in recent times. In John, he, my father, do the work. I do these things. You see the gospel according to John emphasizing the relationship Jesus has with God as his father. But you know what? And throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus kept pointing to God as his father. Jesus also went ahead to teach his disciples, those who believe in Jesus, those who follow Jesus, that look, he is not just my father. When you follow me, he becomes your father. When you obey me, he also becomes your father. So he said, when you fast, this is the way you fast so that your father who sees in secret can reward you in the open. When you pray, this is the way you pray. Don't be like the hypocrites. This is the way you pray so that your father who sees you in secret can reward you in the open. When you give, don't give for show off. Don't give to, 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 to stylishly get yourself into reckoning and pro promotion. This is the manner you give so that your father who sees you in the closet can reward you in the open. Jesus came to show us that this creator, this almighty God, this God of war, the Lord Sabaoth, also has a family. And his father, he is patriarch over that family. Somebody say amen to that. Let me take one more here and we'll close for tonight. Lessons from Jesus, the revelation of Jesus as the son of God. Jesus as the son of the living God makes us to know how to conduct ourselves in God's family. We've established to us, God has a family and Jesus has introduced us that if we follow him, we can become a part of that family. And so here, Jesus also wants us to know how to behave, how to conduct ourselves, how to speak, how to relate in the, the family. So that God can be our God and he can be our father and we know them. Receive goodwill from God and from all men. Receive divine direction. Jesus, as the son of the living God, makes us to know how to conduct ourselves in God's family and how we can also receive from him. Romans chapter 8. I'd like to read from verse 28 to verse 30. He says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. 
to them who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, that is whom God the Father did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to who? The image of a miracle worker, the image of a teacher, the image of the apostle, the image of a soon coming king, the image of a suffering savior. No, the image of his son. There's a son dimension in the revelation of Jesus. He said that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn amongst many brethren or brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me read the newer translation so you get clarity from this. Let me read the Passion translation from verse 28 to verse 30. It says, so we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together for good. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his design purpose. For he knew all about us before we were born. And he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. To think like his son. To function like his son. To behave like his son. To relate like his son. To share the likeness of his son. This means the son is the oldest. The firstborn. How many people are firstborn in this house? Firstborn of your parents. My hands are lifted because I am in my family. Yeah. So you have other ones coming after you. Many a times, one of the responsibilities of being firstborn is that you be a good example. That others can follow. Not a bad example that becomes regrettable for the other members of the family. Firstborn runs into the ditch. All the younger ones are following him gallantly into the ditch. You want to know how to behave? You want to know how to receive from the father? You want to know how to function in the family of God? To show you a member of this divine family. Look to Jesus. For he knew all about us before we were born. And he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. This means the son is the oldest amongst a vast family. Somebody say vast family. Say it one more time. Vast family of brothers and sisters. So actually, in scriptural context, Jesus is not our father. Jesus is not our uncle. <laughs> He's a more. He's a brother. That means, this means the son is the oldest amongst a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. Last verse there, verse 30. Thank you. Having determined our destiny ahead of time, he called us to himself and transferred his perfect righteousness to everyone he called. And those who possess his perfect righteousness, he co-glorified with his son. I love this. And so, when you learn from Jesus, when you, see, when you comprehend the revelation of Jesus as the son, you can receive from the father. You can receive mercy. Shall we all rise to our feet tonight? In case you are in need of mercy in here and you know you are a member of the family of God. You are a member of the family where God is not just God, he is father. You can receive mercy from your father. You can receive forgiveness from your father. You can receive the love of the father. You can find direction from your father. You can receive wisdom. Whatever you need, call on him, the father, God almighty, as your father tonight. And ask him, it may be forgiveness, it may be mercy. It may be direction. It may be wisdom. Maybe you need favor. Maybe you need help in any aspect of your life. Maybe you need healing. I'd like you to tell him in a moment tonight. Jesus is the pattern son. He's the plumb line son. He's the standard bearer. He shows us how to relate to the father. He shows us how we can receive from the father. We can receive mercy. We can receive forgiveness. We can receive audience with the father. We can receive wisdom, goodwill. We can receive divine direction. We can find our way because the father is willing to show the way. Jesus becomes the firstborn in a vast family. The oldest brother in a vast family of brothers and sisters. Talk to the Lord in a moment. Talk to the Lord in a moment. Lord, I thirst for you. 
I long to be in your presence. My soul will wait on you. Father, draw me nearer. Draw me nearer into the beauty of your holy place. I'd like you to talk to God as your father. In the consciousness of who Jesus is to you. As the son, the pattern son. The standard bearer. The one who shows us how to live. The one who shows us how to please the father. The one who shows us how to, uh, how to draw from the father. Draw fatherhood. Draw nurture. Draw help, draw goodwill, draw wisdom, draw direction. One more minute. Ezeka Toshi Gabaita Kandori Katani Damiga Jayashi Yopora Kazota Jesus. Let your revelation be implanted in my heart your revelation as the son of the living god that by this revelation i may also come into the fullness of the benefits of the family of god i may come into the fullness of the possibilities of the family of my heavenly father that I may know my rights in this great family. That I may enjoy great benefits in this great family. That I may receive mercy, receive help, receive direction, receive strength for my body. As a member of the family of God, my heavenly father. <laughs> Thank you Lord. Because we are prayed in Jesus name. And whatever and carries the nature of God, carries the signature of God, whatever he said he has given unto us, all that pertains to life and godliness, he has given unto us, all that pertains to life and godliness, and I speak over this gathering tonight, whatever you require, whatever you desire, whatever is your allotment, whatever is your allocation, in this season, as you comprehend the revelation of Jesus, as the son of the living God. And thereby coming into the family of God. With God as your father. May you receive great things tonight. May you receive awesome things tonight. May you receive certain things tonight. May you receive mercy. May you receive favor. May you receive forgiveness. May you receive divine direction. May you receive deliverance. May yokes, ungodly yokes be destroyed in your life. In the name of Jesus. May you receive divine strength in your body. May you receive the assurance of belonging to the family of God who is your father. And so shall it be in Jesus name. Amen. Please you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Before I step down I have one other. We should have done this on Sunday but somehow we got things a little bit mixed up. I'd like you to try to get tonight's message. You need to sometimes, uh, probably also because of the way I teach, I see so many things. So you need to listen again and again. Something will be transferred to you. Not something strange, something divine, something godly of the nature of God, of the goodness of God will be transplanted into your life. Will be transferred into your life. We shape a vital part of your person in the family of God. So we have one of our dear sisters who is getting married. And the wedding is actually taking place this weekend. Is this 19th or 13th? 19th, yeah, so next week. So our dear Rachel, um, excuse me, uh, Rachel Tinoye, that's the name I'm trying to get. Rachel Tinoye, she, was, she ministered with the uh, music team tonight. So, shall we receive Rachel? Is she in the house? Sister Rachel, please step out. Step out, step out. Shall we celebrate her? She steps out. So, Sister Rachel, 
is going to be married. In fact, she's traveling for the wedding this weekend. So she'll be getting married in Abuja. Sister Rachel Olamide Tinoye will be joined in holy matrimony to um, Brother Samuel Oluwa Damilola. Oluwa Damilola and Rossiola. Shall we put our hands together for the two of them? So that's his picture. All right. So that is um, so the families of um, um, Senior Apostle uh, um, Tinoye, John Adebayo, and also Special Apostle, okay, Special Apostle, Special Apostle uh, Tinoye, John Adebayo, and Special Apostle um, Aronsiola, David Shola. Um, so these are the families of Sister Rachel Olamide and the family she's getting married to um, of the Aronsiolas. I'd like us to stretch forth our hands towards them and pray for them. Sister Rachel Olamide Tinoye. Also as a point of contact to Brother Samuel Oluadamilola Aronsiola. Pray for them. For God's mercy. For God's goodness. For God's grace. They belong to the family of God. The benefits of being in that family, the provisions in that family, the power in that family will also find expression in their lives, find expression in their marriage, find expression in their home. Pray for fair weather, pray for supernatural supplies. Johnny messes for her and all the other people. The, the fiance is based in Abuja, so he will not be traveling. He, the, the wedding is holding in Abuja. Pray for all the people traveling by air, by rail, by road. Johnny messes. Commit everything, all the ceremonies, traditional, church, reception, honeymoon, and family life afterwards. Commit everything to God's hands. Good success. The presence of God. Their lives will be an extension of the family of God. Their home will be an extension of the family of God. Where God Almighty is Father. And so shall it be in Jesus name and for your information I, I will still pray for you before you get up the traditional wedding is taking place on the 19th of April at Abuja and then also the church wedding is taking place on the 20th of April also at Abuja so um, in case you're able to make the trip I'm sure Rachel will be very glad to receive so on behalf of the two of them, I invite the members of the church to celebrate the occasion and to honor them as they go before the Lord and for the solemnization of holy matrimony. Father, we thank you for Rachel Olamide Tinoye. She has been in this church for like two, three years, but she has been a blessing. Her presence has been felt. Her presence has been known. She has served as a worker. She has been diligent. She has been resourceful. She has been energetic, even in her conduct and function. And Lord, we celebrate you in her. We celebrate your grace on her life. We thank you for bringing her to this holy estate of holy matrimony with um, Brother Samuel, Luadam, Lola, Aronsiola. We commit the two of them into your hands. Known unto you are all your works from the foundations of the earth. We pray the Lord, all the grace, the need, the supply of the spirit, the benefits of heaven, the need to have joint messes, to have successful wedding ceremonies, to have a successful marriage, successful home. We pray that you release grace into their lives in Jesus' name. We ask that you bless them with all that pertains to life and godliness. All the benefits of the family of God. Let it accrue and be accessible to Rachel and Samuel in the name of Jesus. We pray you give them gold for the things of gold. Silver for the things of silver. Precious stones for the things of precious stones. Give them precious children. Male, female. As many as they desire of you. As many as you have ordained for them. In the name of Jesus. Lord bless this union. And make them mighty indeed. Let them be billboards of your mercy. Billboards of your greatness. Billboards of your love. And we use that as a point of contact also to people, ladies, gentlemen. Trusting God for such estate. Holy matrimony. Lord, the way you have directed and helped this couple. Help all such individuals. And make a name for yourself out of all such lives. We thank you, Father, for answers to prayers. Because we are praying in Jesus' name. Shall we put our hands together for Rachel? Congratulations.
Hey, congratulations. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Quickly, let's pray for our pastor. Let's pray just as he has brought God's word to us. The revelation of Jesus as the Son of God will remain alive and active in his heart and spirit and every part of his ministry and his family. Pray that God's hand will continue to be upon his life and home. And so shall it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Quickly, like our ushers to help us receive our tithes and offering. Uh, just in case you're online, you could give through the account details on the screen or your around go ahead go ahead to give uh, the offering as we we'll listen to the full announcement the duty pastor for the week still remains pastor yemi so let's kindly reach out to him in due course with every information we want to bring to the attention of the church let's remember prevailers place holds this saturday by 6 30 a.m in the morning till 7 30 in the morning the family that prays together stays together. So let's endeavor to join the corporate prayers on Saturday morning, 6.30 in the morning. Remember the uh, last series of uh, the empowerment series for Saturdays. We're all this Saturday by 10 a.m. 10 a.m., right? 1 p.m.? 10, good. So 10 a.m., uh so please everyone is encouraged to join the uh, zoom uh, platform of course we're using the 30 50 60 70 80 uh zoom code but the passcode will be empowered empowered all lowercase uh from 10 a.m so it's one hour so if you come late uh it's you'll regret it because after the one hour i think training there's about a, a section for tests where four persons will be picked uh to be given uh more like a scholarship as well for the this particular uh, uh empowerment series so let's endeavor to work up and let's also remember the city changers will be having their lives momentum on sunday immediately after the service at the gallery so let's all city changers you're encouraged to invite someone and the lord will bless you in jesus name and also let's not forget our parents the teens church is having their teens impact service on the 21st so please if uh, there's a need for you to release your teen uh, when the announcement is made kindly do so and encourage them and the lord will bless you in jesus name let's rise up as we pray for the offering and take the benediction of father we'll thank you once again for the privilege lord to give in obedience to your word our offerings and tithe we ask lord that you bless every hand that has given in obedience and cheerfully lord may your uh, may the revelation of jesus continually be better in our spirit man in the name of jesus christ well thank you father be exalted lord for in jesus mighty name we have prayed amen let's take the benediction hebrews 13 20 and 21 now may the god of peace who brought our lord jesus from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make me complete in every good work to do his will walking in me what is well pleasing in his sight through jesus christ to whom be glory forever and ever amen god bless you